Welcome to Dyslexia, Let's Talk About It, brought to you by the Fundamental Learning Center in Wichita, Kansas, and the Kansas Association for Education Service Agencies, in collaboration with the Kansas State Department of Education and the Literacy Network of Kansas. My name is Tammy Hope, and I am a certified academic language therapist, as well as a certified structured literacy dyslexia specialist. I currently work at Rolf Literacy Academy on the campus of the Fundamental Learning Center. It is a day school for students with a dyslexia learning profile, kindergarten through the fifth grade. At this school, I teach literacy to students as well as assistive technology. Dyslexia is my career, but I also know a lot about it um, from a personal standpoint. I have three children, ages uh, 17, 20, and 30 who have um, dyslexia in varying degrees. So when I'm speaking to you today, I am coming to you today with experience both from a pro professional and educator standpoint, as well as a personal standpoint as a parent of students with dyslexia. So that being said, let's talk about our objectives for today. So the first what we'll do is we'll have an introduction to dyslexia, as well as a simulation of what it's like to be a student with dyslexia. We'll cover some of the common myths about dyslexia. We'll do a little bit of debunking there. And then we'll discuss what dyslexia is and also list some characteristics and a checklist that will be helpful for you as educators. We like to say that there's really no better way for you to understand about dyslexia firsthand than for you to experience as a student might. So we're going to get a simulation for you going as if you were a fifth grade student. Now this student um, profile that we're using um, models a situation that actually did take place. And so a fifth grade student was asked to read a 100 word passage at a fifth grade reading level. The student had been uh, working with an academic language therapist for about a year and a half, meaning they had some one-on-one -on -one remediation for a year and a half. And they um, knew at the time when they looked at the passage that the student would not be able to read several words. That being said, they endeavored to accomplish the task, and what the therapist did was, as the student read to them, they just marked off any of the words that were misread or mispronounced, or the words where parts of words were left out, and that is the passage that I'll be giving you today. You will be given one minute to complete the reading of the passage. Are you ready, friends? Let's begin. So, you've read the passage, you've read that one time, and you've read it cold, but we've got some questions for you that a typical third, or, I'm sorry, fifth grade teacher might have asked. So, what is the setting of the story? Who is the main character? Who is telling the story, or who is the narrator? There is an analogy in this text. What is that analogy? And what was the lesson learned? Typically, um, in this scenario, if we were live and in person, we'd give you an opportunity to answer those questions, um, and it would be very difficult for you to do so. Not only that, but if you had read this passage aloud, as is often expected in these situations, um, you reading this passage, you would sound very much like a student who has a dyslexia profile sounds when they read with the starts and the stalls and the very slow and labored reading. 
Um, what you were also able to experience um, in this simulation is what it's like to only have pieces of the text that you've read for you to base your comprehension answers on. So you really don't have enough information for you to adequately answer any of the questions here. And that's how our students often feel, even if it sounds as though they have muddled through the passage a little bit, when it comes time for them to, to manipulate or synthesize that or analyze that text, they're unable to do so because they've worked so hard to decode and then decoded insufficiently. So that being said, what I always like to do is let you know what the passage actually said. It begins like this. He had never seen dogs fight as these wolfish creatures fought and his first experience taught him an unforgettable lesson. It is true it was a vicarious experience, else he would not have lived to profit by it. Curly was the victim. They were camped near the log store where she, in her friendly way, made advances to a husky dog the size of a full-grown wolf, though not half so large as she. There was no warning, only a leap, in like a flash, a metal clip of teeth, a leap out equally swift, and Curly's face was torn. Now having had that information, it would be much easier for you to answer the questions we previously asked. Some things that we'd like to point out about this is that if you were truly a student with a dyslexic learning profile, what you really had to offer you, if all these things were gone, was guessing. That's really the only strategy that would work for you. And what we have found is that lots of children with a dyslexic learning profile um, are really good at guessing. The problem is that um, when we guess and we fill in the blanks with what we think the answer should be, then we lose out on what the author's intent is. We also lose out on the subtleties and nuances that are in good literature because we're unable to process them as they were meant to be read. Some other things that I like to point out is you are reading this text from a screen, it's very comfortable for you to do so, and I'm not asking you to answer these questions, but how painful or uncomfortable would it be for you to be sitting in a room amongst your peers and having to read this passage and then answer the questions or attempt to answer the questions and fail in front of them? That's one question to you. And then the other thing for you to consider is that the experience for you has been about one minute of your life and for our students with a dyslexic profile, this is something that occurs for them all day, every day in an educational classroom because reading is so fundamental to the learning process. Now you have an idea um, a little bit about what's happening um, with the student. And I also would like to stop here just to talk about one of the major issues that we often don't see when, we're as, when we as educators are talking about students who wrestle with literacy, and that is shame. Um, being unable to read means that you are a failure at the one job that you were supposed to do from age five to about age 18. So from kindergarten through high school, this is your job and you fail at it every day. You fail at it while your peers seem to be um, excelling at it or at least making it through. You fail at it while your teachers keep letting you know what the expectation is for you to be successful at it. You fail at it though that they, they are giving you remediation or telling you that you should be able to do it. And so that makes you say, as a student with dyslexia, and you can ask a lot of students who have dyslexia, look at yourself and say, what's wrong with me? Why can't I get this? And then the words that easily follow that script are, I'm stupid, I'm dumb, I'm no good at this, over and over and over again. And we see this failure when we're assessing children here at the Fundamental Learning Center. We see the shame, we see the things that happen to students as a result of their failure. So it becomes critical imperative and necessary um, for the livelihood of that child and for the, the whole person of that child for us to serve them as best we can as educators. Um, literacy and the lack of literacy, um, I don't think I have to tell any of you what that means to a child in America and this day and age, so vitally important that they do it to be successful, but the other piece is 
so vitally important to their self-esteem, their love of learning, and what's going to happen to them in their future. So that being said, let's take a look at a list of things. If someone told you, I'm dyslexic, what would that mean? Would that mean that I see, read, and write words backwards? Would it mean that I don't read well? Would it mean that I couldn't go to college? Would it mean that I was a slow learner? Would it mean that I am left-handed? Would it mean that I am unmotivated when it comes to print? Would it mean that I had it and now I've now outgrown it? Would it mean that I have a disease? Would it mean that it is more common in boys? Well, the truth is, these are all myths. These are all myths. And as we go through um, and we talk a little bit more about this, what you will find out, as with all, all myths, there's something about that myth that lends it to reality and makes us think that it's possible that it could be true. And we'll talk about why that is for many of these things on this list. So let's get on with a little bit of debunking. First of all, um, in the United States, approximately one in five individuals have dyslexia, and that again is a spectrum, so um, in varying degrees, some very, very mild and some quite profound. And we previously discussed it creates shame of one's own mind while in learning situations. And learning situations occur in every aspect of life. The classroom, on the playing field, in Sunday school, in Boy Scouts or Girl Scouts. Just a bit of news about literacy. We always like to bring these into our messages. We always like to discuss the um, National Assessment of Education Progress Scores, the NAEP scores. Hopefully you're familiar with these. But um, reading scores at the fourth grade level, they're co collected by state and disaggregated into these various categories. So we always like to include these because they're real relevant with regards to literacy. These are the 2019 scores for Kansas. These are uh, basic and below percentages. So if we want to know what the basic and below percentage, basic is defined. The level denotes part mastery of prerequisite knowledge and skills that are fundamental for proficient work at each grade. And this indicates that there's quite a few of our students in every category who are at that basic or below, which means they are not at proficient. So when we include in these numbers the one in five that we just mentioned who have dyslexia, those children are included in these numbers as well. And dyslexia really is not a discriminator. So of every race and socioethnic ethnic background, um, our students experience dyslexia. Let's start talking about some of those myths. Students who have a dyslexic learning profile can have difficulties that manifest themselves in reading, in writing, in spelling, in speaking, in processing oral and written language, in word retrieval, and in mathematics. Okay, so let's talk about what is dyslexia. We shall answer that question a little bit. So the definition is that it is a specific learning disability that has a biological basis in the brain. It is characterized by difficulties with encoding, that is, seeing the symbol and matching the sound to it, reading, encoding, hearing the sound and matching the appropriate symbol, that's spelling, and accurate and or fluent word recognition, recognizing that whole word. Let's take a look at some of the research that's happened in the US. In 1965, the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development Educational Research was in initiated to focus on reading difficulties as it became clear how extensive reading problems were in the general population in the United States. So, with this new awareness, reading problems in the U.S. were deemed a major health issue. As a result of that major health issue, this multidisciplinary research program took place from 1985 
to 2005. It occurred all over the United States in various locations. As a result, this multidisciplinary research gave us a really broad understanding of dyslexia because it was such a, a longitudinal study over that 20 years and it gave us a lot of information. So at the end of that study, that was in 2005, at the end of that study, and since then we have known quite a bit about dyslexia. So it is now 2021, so this information we've had for over 15 years. So this is what we know today from the research at the NICHD. And I will also state that um, as a result of this, information from 2005, the things that we have learned in research that follows only substantiate or support this further. So there hasn't been research that contradicts the findings. So again, what we know about the prevalence of dyslexia is that it does affect about one in five people in the population. Yes, that does mean approximately 20% of your classroom has dyslexia in some form or fashion, or rather in a varying degree. Um, it is equally frequent in boys and girls. Um, what's different is how it manifests itself and the behavior of boys and girls. And what we find about girls is that girls tend to be at younger age, younger ages, very verbal and are able to compensate with relational and successful interpersonal communication skills. They're able to compensate fairly well um, where boys maybe don't at an earlier age and so we can see those signs a little bit earlier at times. Um, we know that it is carried hereditarily on the sixth, first, and 15th chromosomes. And the sixth chromosome is responsible for our immune system. So we'll see that when we talk about checklists, how that might manifest itself. Um, the biggest warning sign of all is having a close relative who struggled to learn to read, write, or spell. And I'd like to uh, pause here just to point out that oftentimes um, as educators, when you're talking to family members, what you'll hear someone say is, um, school was okay for me, but I'm a really bad speller. I've always been a really bad speller. And what we have found is that um, socially, it's pretty acceptable to be a poor speller. Nobody judges you for being a poor speller, but you are pretty severely judged for an inability to read. So most people will not admit to the fact that they are not good readers, but will admit that they are not good spellers. So that may be something that you hear, and that's also a very clear and pretty consistent warning sign that there is um, a history of struggle in the area of academics. So the long-term outcomes indicate to us that 74% of children who were poor readers in the third grade remained poor readers in the ninth grade despite intervention. So whatever strategies were being used at this time were not successful enough to bridge the gap in their deficient reading between the third and ninth grades. Additionally, nine out of 10 children deficient in reading in the first grade were still poor readers in the fourth grade. And also, eight out of 10 children with severe word reading problems at the end of first grade were well below average readers in the beginning of the third grade. This served to reinforce to us that whatever it was that we had been do doing, if we studied those children over time, we were finding that it was ineffective and something different needed to happen. So what are the facts? Dyslexia is the most prevalent reading disability affecting 20% of the US population. It does create problems with automatic retrieval of words and memory for non-meaningful symbols. Those non-meaningful symbols are the letters of the alphabet, which generally hampers an individual's ability to read, spell, form letters legibly, and put thoughts into writing. It is caused by phonological processing difficulties, not visual acuity, convergence, or processing. Dyslexia lasts a lifetime it is not curable. And while dyslexia itself is not curable, we know that the things that are problematic about dyslexia can be remediated and can be learned. So we can teach people with dyslexia how to read, write, and spell correctly, but that profile of their brain, that lifelong profile, will not change. The prognosis depends on the severity of the disorder and the remedial approach. And finally, dyslexia affects the entire population and is not related to intelligence. And this means that dyslexia does not discriminate. So 
Now that we know that those are the facts, let's look at some things that we might see as educators um, and children. We'll begin with preschool to kindergarten. Some red flags include delays in speech, late learning to talk, mixing up the sounds and syllables and long words. Oftentimes we'll hear students um, saying things like paschetti instead of spaghetti, pacific instead of specific, tornado as opposed to volcano, just mixing up those sounds and words. So difficulty in producing and recognizing rhymes, a neurotypical child should be able to do this around age three. Constant confusion of left versus right, again, the issues with directionality. Chronic ear infections. Difficulty learning to tie their shoes. Um, what we have experienced at the Ross Literacy Academy is that we have students who are as old as nine years old who are still struggling to tie their shoes. Trouble memorizing their address, phone number, or the alphabet. And that is remembering the alphabet without singing. Difficulty remembering road information, such as letter names, addresses, and other children's names. And difficulty remembering and following directions. When we move into the elementary school age, that list of red flags expands quite a bit because we're now in the educational arena and some of the things that are problematic with dyslexia are more evident on a daily basis. So what we find is that a lot of students with dyslexia have dysgraphia, which is slow, non-automatic handwriting that is very difficult to read. Letter or number reversals at the end of first grade or after age seven. Extreme difficulty learning cursive. Slow, choppy, and inaccurate reading. A major symptom is guessing what words are rather than being able to sound them out. Skipping or misreading words. Ignoring suffixes on words. The inability to sound out unknown words. Terrible spelling. Students' inability to remember sight words and difficulty telling time, particularly with an analog clock. Additionally, our students have trouble with math because math really is just a different language and there's lots of similarities in that language. Multiplication, addition, subtraction, they're all of the shuns that are very difficult to differentiate um, by um, a student with dyslexia, just all that language. Memorizing addition and multiplication facts, those symbols often do not have meaning to students, just like the letters of the alphabet do not have meaning and memorizing them and those facts can be very difficult. Memorizing a sequence to a step. Problems with directionality, and we talked about this, always moving from left to right in word text is a really important concept to understand and is difficult for students with a dyslexia learning profile. Difficulty for read, word retrieval for specific words, and this is also tied to the next three. Um, struggle with remembering the names of people, object numbers, and letters, and difficulty finding correct word when speaking. Um, oftentimes this is referred to as the tip of the tongue syndrome, where we know that the, we have a word that we want to retrieve, but we just can't pull it out. And oftentimes in students with a dyslexia profile, we find that they're telling you everything about that object. They can give you lots and lots of details about the object, but they cannot name the specific thing. So an example would be a child saying, hey, it's that thing in our dining room. And sometimes we sit there and we do our homework, but other times we eat dinner there and there's a big flower in the middle of it. And the word that they didn't retrieve was table, but they told you everything else about it to indicate that they know what they're talking about, but they just can't pull that single word. Um, students dread school. By this point in time, they know that school is an exercise in futility for them, and they're failing at the thing they should do well, um, so they don't like going. And again, the manifestation of headaches and stomach pains. Um, particularly as educators, we will see students doing this. The closer the student becomes in their day to the task that contains their greatest weakness or struggle. So if a student has PE and music and something else they really enjoy before reading, then that student seems like they're perfectly fine for those first three classes. And then when we start pulling out the things for reading, that's when we have to go to the bathroom or we start having a headache or a stomach ache. And that is an indicator that something is amiss. 
So once we get to high school, the red flags include everything that we saw in the elementary school age and some additional ones. And those include limited vocabulary, and we know that this is because students who have made it this far in school without having been remediated, that their vocabulary is limited because they have not had the exposure to print necessary to acquire the academic vocabulary they need. We will also find at this point that a student's vocabulary that they speak orally or verbally is far beyond what you see and what they produce in spelling or written work. That's a huge red flag. You know that the child is intelligent and can communicate that intelligence to you verbally, but they cannot do so in writing. Extremely poor written expression, we just discussed that. The inability to master a foreign language, if they had difficulty mastering English, is even more difficult attaching new sounds to new or similar symbols. Difficulty reading printed music, this does not mean that we don't have excellent musicians who um, have that dyslexia learning profile, but they do have difficulty learning music, and oftentimes there's uh, dyslexia students who are very successful at playing music um, by ear. They have poor grades in many classes because reading is required for multiple classes by the time they get to high school, so science, social studies, including history, um, even the home economics, that vocabulary in any print, and we are unsuccessful at times whenever we have to interact with print. Um, and then we also see a great amount of depression and also anxiety, academic anxiety, um, generalized depression after having lots of years of failure over what's happening here. And additionally, poor attendance as students get older and they have a little bit more freedom to exercise when they will and will not go to school, we start seeing students be at school less and less when they are not successful. So we had a previous definition of dyslexia that said that it was biologically based in the brain. And while that is true, there is what we believe here at the Fundamental Learning Center is a better definition of that. In our experience, no one defines dyslexia better than Dr. Sally Shaywitz. She is a distinguished professor in learning development at Yale University School of Medicine, co-director of the Yale Center for Dyslexia and Creativity. So together with her husband, they originated and championed the sea of strengths model of dyslexia. And it emphasizes a sea of strengths of higher critical thinking and creativity surrounding the encapsulated weakness found in children and in adults who are dyslexic. And what this means is that there's this unexpected weakness. And we want to look here at a model of an individual profile, and this is what we would expect in a neurotypical learner on the Wixler Intelligence Scale, which measures cognitive ability. So, we're measuring arithmetic, vocabulary, comprehension, digit span, symbol search, picture completion, coding, picture arrangement, block design, object assembly, digit span, and phonological processing. What we expect for those things is that they fall within a relatively normal range with not many outliers. We're not talking about several degrees of difference between one measure to the next, and this would be a neurotypical child of average to above average intelligence. And when we talk about unexpected weakness is what we see in a dyslexia student's profile on those same tasks. And this is what we see here is again, lots of things in that the normal range or in the average range with even some very high outliers. Um, very often we see that outlier being what's pictured here, which is high level visual spatial giftedness or visual spatial awareness and processing but the unexpected deficit, this unexpected measure that includes auditory processing, phonological processing, and oftentimes short-term memory. Those things bring down the ability of this student to do those really basic, basic functions of reading, writing, and spelling, and they're unexpected because we know the child is intelligent. 
One note as we look at this unexpected weakness for a very intelligent child is that we want to be careful as educators not to mistake their inability to perform well in reading, writing, and spelling for a lack of intelligence. This profile tells us that we have an adequately intelligent child in front of us, but they are struggling in an unexpected way and a way that we can prove to serve and remediate. That being said, what can you do? Well, if you see a child who's exhibiting any of these red flags, you can ask a couple of questions. Two important questions are, number one, did that child experience chronic ear infections or upper respiratory inf infections when they were younger? This relates to the immune system chromosome number six. And the second question is, did a member of that, child, that child's extended family or immediate family struggle in school or struggle to learn? And again, we talked previously about the admission that they struggle to spell, that is a red flag. Number two, be sure you understand the risks of undiagnosed reading difficulties. And we saw that earlier on that earlier research that said that the ability to read or to be proficient at reading does not change over time for a student if there is not specific intervention for that child. So the scores that didn't change from the first to the third grade or from the fourth to the ninth grade, that's the consequences of undiagnosed reading difficulties. Number three, the NIH researchers have proven that phonemic awareness is the core and causal factor separating a normal or neurotypical reader from disabled readers. So all remedial programs must begin with phonemic awareness and research has also shown that it must continue. Phonemic awareness must continue um, to elevated parts of the phonemic awareness hierarchy as long as that child is in remediation for reading. Number four, reading remediation must take place daily for no less than 60 minutes in a small group, preferably one-to-one, -one, no more than one-to-four with a highly qualified professional using a proven reading instructional approach for children with dyslexia. We'll start there and then we'll move on to things that we can do in the classroom while a child is being remediated for reading. There are some things that we can do to help them be successful in their general education classroom. So first of all, it lists books on tape on a resource called Learning Ally. Right now with um, technology being what it is, there's lots of ways that we can get students access to literature that they cannot read independently. So we've had lots of success at the Rolf Literacy Academy in our assistive technology classes by simply using PDFs and synthetic voices to read those things to students. So um, that's one way. Audiobooks, obviously, in lieu of checking out a book from the library. And one of the major reasons for this was to address one of the red flags that we saw in high school students where they have limited vocabulary because they don't have access to academic print because they are not reading those texts. So what we wanna do is give those students access to grade level or higher text in audio form or digital form so they're able to acquire and not miss out on all that vocabulary while they're being remediated for reading. We already previously discussed that we could assist children by having one-to-one -one or one-to-four tutoring. So we want to do that tutoring in a small group during school or immediately after school. We don't want to be tutoring very late in the day when the child is brain tired. For older students, we want to allow a note taker for them. So that would be just a student who shares notes with them. Um, a smart pen that would do the recording for them. Oftentimes we've had instructors who just simply give the students a copy of the notes that they need and then they can follow those notes along um, as a lecture takes place or as class instruction is taking place. We want to provide extended time for the completion of tasks when those tasks involve reading, writing, and spelling. We also want to reduce the number of items for homework. We want to reduce that number of items down to the point where the student is demonstrating their knowledge or mastery of the content. If a student can illustrate a mathematical um, process and they can do so with four different problems and show that they understand the process and how it's done, then limit it to four as opposed to giving them a full page of 20. 
administer exams or tests orally when possible. A student may be able to expand upon their answer more effectively when they speak it to you as opposed to having to write it down. Again, we talked about that limited vocabulary. Help a child by providing an assignment sheet or book with assignments already written in. If your child is having difficulty with transcribing information from a whiteboard, then write it in the text for them so they have the information they need when they go home to complete their work. Assignments and instructions must be read to the student. And again, at Ross Literacy Academy here on the FLC campus, we find that doing so through a PDF is very effective. There's some great technology um, where you can just snap and then read as well. So um, you can give the students some independence if you're using technology to give those instructions to them, or you can have a staff member or peer read instructions as well. Accept dictated assignments in place of a student written response. And now again, with the age of technology, there's lots of ways that we can have a student demonstrate their content knowledge, either um, by dictating that, providing a video, a multimedia production of some sort, some way that you can see that they understand the content and they can express that to you without having to write while they are still being remediated for reading, writing, and spelling. We're going to allow these things so they can show content knowledge and still remain in their classroom. Be sensitive to noisy environments when presenting important information. If we understand that it's an issue of phonological processing and discriminating those sounds, we need to make sure that the environment is free of noise so they can effectively hear what's being taught or said to them. And finally, we had um, a young man come visit our center for assessment and he really enjoyed his time though he doesn't really enjoy his time at school and he left a letter and this is typical of a student that might come to visit us this is john's letter after he was assessed he said i need help in reading and spelling and i need help with b's and d's as you can see by his writing over here i hope that i come again it's fun yay and he never came back. We're hoping that students like this who come to us and never come back um, after an assessment and we don't know if they've ever gotten the remediation that they need, we're hoping that in sharing this information with you, those students will no longer fall through the gaps but be found by the information, um, using the information that you've learned over the course of this segment and lecture today. Thank you. This model was developed with funds from the Literacy Network of Kansas, a federal striving readers comprehensive literacy initiative in partnership with the University of Kansas Center for Research on Learning. The $27 million grant was awarded to the Kansas State Department of Education in 2017 to improve literacy at the community, regional, and state level.